Okay, I'll go ahead and start. Hello, everybody. I'm Diana. I'm from Crystal Light and I'm the brand marketing manager. Today, I'll be moderating um, together with Anna. So before we start, just uh, in case you are new to our virtual class, normally we mute uh, everybody so that, you know, we can have less uh, noise and we can focus on um, the speaker. And in case you have any questions, we have the Zoom group chat and you can post your questions there and we will have a Q&A session at the end where we will uh, get Anna to help to answer as many questions as possible. So for now, I'd like to introduce Anna. Okay, Anna Cavallo is born in Portugal and she studied onology in Vila Real and also in Bordeaux. So she spent the first years of her career working as an assistant winemaker in Chile, New Zealand and Duoro Valley. She joined EXA in 2014 and is now the brand ambassador for seven EXA wineries since 2018. Today she will be sharing with us the top three wineries that we are focusing on, Chateau Pichon Baron and Chateau Sudero from Bordeaux and Quinta do Nebel from Portugal. So um, without further ado, I'd like to pass to Anna for her to start her presentation and she will also talk a little bit uh, about herself. Yes. Hello everyone. Good afternoon. It is morning for me and I'm very happy to, to show you this amazing set of uh, five wines. Uh, we'll go from white to red to port, so uh, interesting tasting uh, for everyone today. Um, as you said, I, I represent all the wineries of uh, Axie Millezim, which is a group of uh, exceptional vineyards. It's a French group that started investing in wine in the 80s uh, and nowadays has a, a beautiful portfolio that goes from Bordeaux with wines at Chateau Pichon Baron in Poyac, uh, also Sautern. Uh, we also have wineries in uh, Hungary, in uh, USA, in Napa Valley, and of course in, in Portugal, where I'm uh, originally from. Uh, as you also said, I started in production. I studied winemaking in my uh, first years, uh, already a long time ago, almost uh, 13, 14 years ago. And um, then I moved on to communication. And nowadays, that's my focus. I do a lot of wine dinners, webinars since the, the lockdown started, uh, a lot of wine events overall. And of course, in 2020, these events have um, online more than live. Uh, and we're all getting used to these uh, actually very fun tastings where we can still get a lot of close contact with you. Uh, do ask questions uh, at the end. Uh, and do not hesitate to also ask uh, technical questions. I'll be very happy to, uh, to answer those too. So on this first slide that you see, uh, you can see all the wineries of the Aximilazine group. It goes, so on the top, you see the beautiful castle of Chateau Pichon Baron. Uh, you also see on the bottom, the vineyards in the Douro, in Tokai, and then the USA. And what's better than a map on the next slide uh, to show you exactly where our vineyards are. It's always helpful to see location. So uh, today our uh, traveling will start in the Bordeaux area with Chateau Sudiro in Sautern, but we'll actually taste the dry white, even if this region is famous for uh, opulent, uh, botrytis affected uh, sweet wines. Uh, the, not, the, the other thing that is very interesting in the area is dry white, and that's where we'll start. We, you can also see on the map in close to uh, Bonn, well, it's actually in Nuit Saint-Georges, we have Domaine de l'Arlo uh, that also has vineyards in Romanet Saint-Vivant. Maybe we have some Burgundy lovers today too. Uh, so uh, that's also from the group Aximilazim since 1987. And if we travel a bit further east uh, to Hungary, in northeast Hungary, in the region of Tokai, we have the Shnoko, which is definitely an example, a model of Azu, uh, Tokai, and Essencia in this region of, uh, of Hungary. Then, uh, of course, in Portugal, uh, we have Quinta do Noval, which is the equivalent of a first growth uh, for the Portuguese uh, uh, Douro Valley. It's uh, the, the producer that is most respected uh, in the world of uh, vintage port, and today we'll taste vintage 17 at the very end of the tasting. And to finish with our portfolio of wineries, we also have outpost wines in uh, Napa Valley. It's actually in a, a AVA called Howell Mountain, uh, higher up 
in the in the mountains, which gives it a bit of freshness and a very interesting spot for Cabernet Sauvignon. We are passionate about Cabernet Sauvignon at Axe Millezim because, of course, we have one of the best terroirs for Cabernet at Pichon Barron. And two years ago, we decided to invest also in Napa Valley uh, and acquire the 10 acres of uh, outpost that also specializes in, uh, in great Cabernet. So that gives you an idea of all the wineries of the group. Uh, and now we'll focus on the wines that we're tasting today. We can move on to the next slide uh, to focus on the Bordeaux region, where we'll start our journey. So you can see Bordeaux city, a bit in the middle. Uh, you can see Chateau Sudero close to Sauterne in the south of Bordeaux. It's about 45 minutes drive to the south. And you can see Chateau Pichon Baron and Chateau Pibran, another winery from our group, uh, close to Poyac, inside the Poyac AOC. And this is about one hour drive north uh, from the city of Bordeaux. As you can tell by the map, uh, Bordeaux region is influenced by two big bodies of water that are very important. The Atlantic Ocean, of course, uh, and the Gironde estuary. You can see the large estuary uh, close to Poyac. And this estuary is formed by two rivers uh, that you see more towards the bottom of the screen, the Dordogne and the Garonne. And this is all very important because when you are near the water, you have temperatures that are more mild. You have uh, temperatures that are never too cold and never too hot. And that's really good weather for uh, viticulture. It also means that we are less sensitive to hazards like frost, for example. When you're close to the water, you're uh, much less likely to have problems with frost in spring than if you are in a very continental area, like for example, uh, Burgundy or uh, uh, in Germany, some areas are very prone to frost. We are lucky in Bordeaux to be in between waters. Uh, and that really helps with the climate in the vineyards. We'll first focus on uh, Chateau Sudiro with the first white wine, that is uh, S de Sudiro. So on the next slide, you can see a picture of the winery in Sauter. This is our castle, our chateau. Uh, chateau Sudiro is a very old property. Uh, we've been making wine on the same site, on the same place, since 1580, so since the 16th century. Uh, and probably even before, but before that it was more of a farm. Um, we specialize, of course, in white varieties, Semillon and Sauvignon Blanc. And in this estate, um, we have 91 hectares. So it's quite a big property for the area. And we are in a nice neighborhood because we are uh, right next to uh, a small, uh, very famous chateau called Chateau de Cam. That's our closest neighbor. Um, and you can walk there, actually. It's uh, right at the end of our vineyard starts Chateau de Cam. So very nice location at Sudiro. It is a first growth. Um, in Sauterne classification, you have um, first growth and then you have another level, which is first growth superior, superior, where you only have Chateau de Cam. And after Chateau de Cam, we are at the, uh, the best level uh, of this classification. So very well uh, classified already in the 19th century classification. We make beautiful Sauterne here. Uh, if you move into the, the next slide, actually, just to see the vineyards uh, better, uh, you can see a very typical situation in this area, which is mist. Uh, because we are close to the river Garonne and to the small river Siron, they meet each other, um, we get uh, a lot of mist in the morning. And this is very helpful to make the sweet styles of the region, the Sauterne styles. Uh, because when you have mist, the fungus botrytis will develop on the berries and will concentrate the sugar, the natural sugars of uh, the grapes. And so this area is naturally adapted to make botrytis style uh, sweet wines. However, um, already since the 90s, in this area, you have some wineries that are doing dry white uh, too, because you can have a very nice expression of Semillon and Sauvignon Blanc that is very different from the uh, type of wine you have in um, Pessac Leonia or Entre de Mer. So you get another uh, style of Bordeaux white, of Bordeaux Blanc. 
when the wine is not uh, sweet in Sautern, you cannot call it Sautern. So on the label, you have the samples, which are very cute. Um, on the label, you can see that it doesn't say Sautern. It just goes into the Bordeaux white uh, classification. Um, we make this with the same varieties as Sautern, but of course, uh, we use berries that are completely healthy and very ripe. Uh, on uh, the next slide, you can see the difference between uh, the grapes that we use for Sautern and the grapes that we use for dry white. Um, for the dry white, for this one specifically, we picked very early in September. Uh, actually, the one you're tasting 2016, I checked, and the grapes were picked in only two days. So you're tasting the result of uh, two days of harvest, the 7th and 8th of September 2016. Um, and we pick early to make sure that we don't have the fungus yet. We have very healthy grapes that are very ripe uh, and uh, of course rich in sugar and aromas, but not shriveled. To pick for the Sautern, we wait uh, much longer into October and some years, even November. Um, you always have to be very patient to make the sweet styles. Uh, and we pick the bunches berry by berry or parts of bunches uh, that look like the one you see on the other picture where you have a lot of fungus and uh, the bunches are very concentrated and shriveled. So that's the main difference. To ferment and to age the dry white that you are tasting, don't worry, <laughs> I, can, uh, I can do it with the barrel too. Um, we uh, ferment and age in barrels. That's why we, uh, I wanted to show you one. So as the Suduro is a very ambitious, uh, complex white, it's not a, a style that is the crisp, easy drinking. It's all about complexity and creaminess on the palate. And to achieve that, we ferment and age in French oak. Uh, for nine months, it stays in the barrel. But we try uh, to, of course, not have too much uh, oak influence. That's why it's only nine months, and that's why it's only 20% new oak on the S de Sudoro. We just want the barrel to give it a texture that is very interesting on the palate and that you'll taste now with first wine uh, of today. I've poured already. I used the Coravin to uh, save, <laughs> to save my, my bottle. Um, so if you move, I'll give you some time. If you move into the, the first bottle of the first sample, you'll have S. de Sudiro Old Vines 2016. That's what I have in my hands. And you can move to the next slide. Next please. slide, yeah that you can see the blend at the same time as I'm explaining. So, uh, in this case, we have quite a classic blend for this region, 56% Semillon and 44% Sauvignon Blanc. But the star here really is the Semillon, and that's what marks the wine the most. Semillon gives you um, wines that are quite big for a white wine, uh, quite opulent, creamy, and actually with aromas that go more into the pear aromas uh, and a bit flower, uh, white flowers too. Whereas the Sauvignon Blanc, as you know, uh, from Sauvignon Blancs of all over the world, uh, it's a very um, tropical, uh, sometimes a bit uh, gooseberry, uh, very aromatic uh, type of grape variety. Um, which is present here, uh, but only 44%. And in our soils, it's actually a more restrained style of Sauvignon Blanc. You will never get that very uh, passion fruit Sauvignon Blanc that you get in, uh, in New Zealand, for example. You'll never get it in, uh, in Bordeaux. You'll get a much more restrained, subtle uh, aromas at, uh, at the Sauterne Terroir. Why? Because we have different weather, of course, but also because our soils are made of gravels, uh, small stones brought by the river, mixed with sand. So that's the soil at, uh, at Chateau Suduro. Let's taste. Mm -hmm. Today, I'm just having a little sip, so not, uh, <laughs> not spitting yet. Um, as you can tell in this wine, even if it has this big body of the Semillon, it's still very fresh and pleasant. This one, I would imagine it probably with uh, dishes that have chicken, for example, it can be very nice with roast chicken, or with dishes uh, of fish 
but with some sauce, with some creamy sauce, maybe white sauce, some type of, um, uh, of gravy, because it is a more ambitious, a more serious white wine. Um, it's not so much on the lemon, grapefruit type of aroma. You have more to it. You have these hints of toast. You can feel a bit of uh, hints of vanilla, a bit of spice uh, on the nose. And that also comes from the fact that we are using very old uh, vineyards at the property. We are using vineyards from the 40s, from the 50s and the 60s maximum um, for the Semillon. So the oldest Semillon goes into S, uh, which makes it such a complex white wine and a white wine that you can actually age. We are tasting 16, so not that young for a white already. And if you want, you can still age it for uh, many, many years. So very interesting white, very ambitious white that shows you a different aspect uh, of Sauterne in a dry uh, version. Mm -hmm. I hope you uh, enjoyed this, uh, this first uh, wine that we have. Um, we'll now travel a bit north of Bordeaux uh, to the area of Pouillac AOC because we have three wines from Pouillac to taste from Chateau de Baron. We have, of course, our top wine, Chateau Pichon Baron, but we also have our second levels. I'll show you the bottles because you have the, the mini samples. I want you to see the, the full Thanks. size. <laughs> so you have, you're going to taste Tourelle, you're going to taste Griffon, and you're going to taste Pichon Baron. Before we start the explanation, I thought it could be nice to see a video so you can see the vineyards and the, the different seasons. So please enjoy. <laughs>
So just for a quick explanation, the man on the, on the video is, of course, our, our general manager, Christian Sealy, uh, who's been uh, managing all the wineries of access since 2001 and Quinta do Noval since 1994. Uh, he's actually British, but uh, he moved to Bordeaux a, a long time ago. He, he says the food is better in France, so uh, he's a, a gastronomy refugee, as he likes to say. <laughs> a very fun man, too. I hope one day you can, uh, you can maybe uh, see him at a tasting in Singapore. Um, so the other uh, person on the, on the painting, actually, that, uh, that you saw that was winking uh, the eye, that's the Baron of Pichon Longueville. So the name of our, uh, of our winery, uh, Pichon Longueville Baron, uh, Pichon Baron, as we say, uh, comes from uh, the seven generations of uh, Barons of Pichon Longueville that we had uh, at the property. Uh, Pichon was created in uh, 1694. Um, and it stayed in the same family for many generations. Uh, and later, of course, uh, in the 1930s, they, they sold uh, to a different family, the Bottier, and uh, this family sold to Axe in, uh, in 1987. Uh, what we did uh, when we arrived at the, at the property, is, of course, to keep uh, this great heritage, this great history, uh, and invest in renovating uh, the cellars, the buildings, and uh, also uh, restricting the amount uh, of wine made and making it uh, better and uh, a more strict selection that you can see in the result of uh, Pichon Baron uh, nowadays. On this beautiful picture, you can see, of course, our Cinderella castle. <laughs> we are lucky to have a Renaissance uh, style uh, 19th century castle that we use today as our offices. We are very spoiled. We get to work on the, on the top floor of the of the castle every day. It's a lovely place to, uh, to work. Um, and we also do dinners uh, and lunches there for uh, private uh, VIP customers. Uh, on the building next to the castle is where we actually have our uh, vinification uh, room uh, that you saw quickly on the video. I'll show you a few more pictures later. And you can also see the water mirror um, that reflects the image of the castle, of course, uh, a very beautiful feature that we added in 2007, but it also plays a role because underneath the water feature, the little pool you see, we have our barrel room. So it helps keep humidity uh, and a nice temperature uh, underground. So it's both uh, for aesthetics, but also uh, because uh, it helps us with, uh, with the humidity keeping. Um, for Pichon Baron, welcoming guests is, is very important and actually this is one of the first chateaus in, in Bordeaux that open its doors uh, to wine tourism. We do um, private visits and tastings all along the year, even on Sundays and public holidays, and that's very rare in France. So <laughs> uh, imagine how important it is for us um, to, to welcome our guests well. Um, and we receive around 11,000 people per year nowadays uh, at Pichon Baron uh, just for the private visits and, and tastings. So it's quite a quite an impressive number. Uh, we recently, last week actually, uh, we were talking before we started the meeting, um, we won, uh, we are on the top 50 uh, world's best vineyards. Uh, it's an award for the best destinations uh, of uh, wine tourism in the world. And we are part of that list. So we're very proud to, uh, to say it. Uh, it just came out last week, the results. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you. It's a, a reward for all the uh, also the investment that AXA did not only in the vineyards and uh, improving white quality, but also in welcoming guests from all over the world. And I do hope that once this situation is, uh, is quieter or hopefully over, uh, everyone will be able to, uh, to travel again and you're most welcome to, uh, to come and visit us at, uh, at Pichon Baron. Um, if we change slides, I'll talk a bit about the vineyards now before we taste the, the tree. Coyacs, the three Pichon Barons. So we uh, were founded, as I said, in 1694. Pichon is a second growth, so a deuxième grand cru classé, according to the classification of 1855. Uh, but many people actually call us a super second because in terms of ratings uh, from the press, from our, um, from our buyers, um, and in terms of reputation, and overall wine quality, we are considered amongst the best of the second uh, classified growth. And that's why we like to use the term 
uh, super second for Pichon Baron. Um, we are very close to the estuary. As you can see in the picture, actually, from our vineyards, you can see the water. Uh, and as I said, this is important because it means we have a very nice um, temperature regulator. That means we had never have extreme temperatures and we have uh, less climate hazards than other uh, vineyards that are more inland uh, in the area. Uh, we're also in front of some very famous uh, properties. Uh, Poyac has the highest proportion of classified growths uh, in Bordeaux, so in itself it's a great appellation for Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot. And uh, where we are specifically, we are right in front of Chateau Latour, um, also uh, close to Léoville Las Cases, uh, Léoville Poiferré, and also Pichon Contes. Uh, so this is really a, a lovely neighborhood to live <laughs> and to make wine, uh, and that counts a lot uh, in, uh, in terms of, uh, of vineyards. Uh, we have 73 hectares, which is a, a normal size for this area. You have some wineries that are a bit bigger, uh, some that are slightly smaller, but this is the average size for uh, classified growth in, um, in Poyac. Mm -hmm. And um, in terms of varieties, Cabernet is king here. So uh, that's the majority of our plantings. We have 65% Cabernet Sauvignon, 30% uh, Merlot, also very important in our blends, and just a little spice of Cabernet Franc and Petit Verdot, very small amounts to give the wines a bit of uh, spiciness. Uh, mm -hmm. So. If we move on, uh, you'll see, oh, can you change please, uh, the slide. You can see the view uh, from the main uh, route, uh, so the road that we take when we drive from Bordeaux to Poyac. This is where you, um, the first thing you, you see from the road. This is the, the D3, uh, also called the wine, uh, the wine road of, uh, of Bordeaux because it, it goes uh, through uh, some of the, the best uh, chateaus uh, in the region. And here you can see uh, a vineyard that's very important to us, which is our historical plot, uh, right next to the road and with the walls around it, next to the chateau too. Uh, this is the site that was already producing wine in the 19th century when we started. This is where we have the oldest vines of Cabernet Sauvignon uh, in our vineyards. And this is really in the continuation of, uh, of the Chateau Latour Anclos uh, vineyard. So very important spot for us um, and very beautiful one too when you are driving from, uh, from Bordeaux. This is where the grapes for our Grand Vin Chateau Pichon Marron uh, come from. If you move on, you'll see uh, an image of our winery. So uh, we do, of course, all the picking by hand. We do a lot of sorting. Uh, we sort actually four times. Um, and this is something that we implemented mostly from the early 2000s on uh, with the arrival of Christian Sealy uh, at the property and the investment from uh, Axel Milazim. So we sort in the vineyard, of course, through the hand picking. We have also um, set, uh, sorting tables before the grapes arrive uh, at the winery where we select bunch by bunch, and then we have an optical sorting machine that will eliminate any berries that are a bit too green, a bit misshaped, uh, or maybe um, that have little imperfections that can come from rot, for example. Uh, the optical sorting machine acts like a scanner. Uh, it will take a picture of your grapes and see if any berry doesn't fit the ideal berry, it will be eliminated by a jet of air that will take out that berry. It's a very precise technology that we've been using actually since 2010, um, so for 10 years now, and that gives us extra precision that you can see in the final wines uh, nowadays. And then we still do a sorting by hand again after the optical sorting. So we're very strict about what gets in. Uh, our winemaker, Jean René, uh, only once, as he says, grape caviar, so it's really, beautiful, perfect, black ripe uh, berries that go into the tanks. Uh, anything that uh, doesn't fit that standard will be eliminated. And that's the luxury of uh, making wine in a classified growth. You don't have to worry about volume or about uh, losing uh, a part of harvest because you are sorting. We will sort as much as we need to make sure that everything that goes into Pichon Baron and Tourelle and Griffon is absolutely 
uh, top quality grapes, uh, grape caviar. Um, in here you see the tanks, it's a really pretty uh, place to work. It's easy to work because it's a round cellar, can you see from the picture? Uh, it's very easy to, to go from one tank to the other because it's round, the distances are, um, are smaller. Also, we have natural light in the middle. Uh, we have an opening of, uh, of light in the middle of the cellar. And as you can see, we vinify both in oak. Uh, we have large oak vats for vinification and we also use uh, stainless steel. We have more than 40 small uh, tanks so that we can separate our 73 hectares in very small plots by variety, of course, but not only. Also by little changes in soil um, and in uh, aspect. Uh, so we really try to vinify plot by plot in very small batches and we only blend later once the wine is in barrel. That's very important to not lose information too soon. You want to respect the, the personality of each little plot of vineyard and only later uh, making the, the marriage, making the wedding. <laughs> so now I think it's time for us to taste as we, we do have a, uh, a few more wines to, uh, yeah. to try. We will start uh, with Turel. You can keep the map because I want to tell you something uh, with the map. Um, Turel is this one. So the, the first red sample that you have, this is our beautiful second label that we've been making since the 1980s. Um, very special for our winemaker Jean-René Matignon. Uh, it's the, a wine that he developed completely. So when he arrived at the winery in 86, we only had one wine, Chateau Pichon Baron. And he was the one who created this cuvee, so it's very special for him. And also his wife picked the name. So it's a, a bit of a romantic story behind the wine too. Um, it has a lot of meaning. He's been at Pichon Baron since 1986. Uh, so he knows our vineyards and our wines by heart uh, and he created our two second wines, Turel and Griffon. So very special um, uh, history of, uh, of wine making at, uh, at Pichon Baron. Mm -hmm. In this, um, can you point to the plots that are more towards the, the other side, towards the left? Um, that area more yeah. exactly, exactly. That's where Turel comes from. So the first red wine that you are going to taste now comes from that area and a little bit on top, you see more inland too, on top there, the little, yes. So all the vineyards that we own are in orange, orange pink, <laughs> uh, depending on your screen. And uh, the winery is actually, uh, can you go towards the right and you see the building there close to the forest? Yes, that's our winery there. Okay. Exactly. Yes, a bit up, that's the winery there. Um, and the historical plot is right in front of it. Um, and Chateau Latour is on the other side of the road. It's that square uh, with vineyards around it, a bit isolated on the right side. So um, the f that's the historical plot, exactly. The Tourelle de Longueville um, has a very special blend because it is a Poyac, but with a majority of Merlot. If you look at the blend on the, on the technical uh, sheet, it's over 60% Merlot, 63% in 2013. So this will give the wine a lot of accessibility, a lot of uh, charm, actually. Merlot is a variety that always gives you silky tannins um, and very round mouthfeel. Uh, the texture is important here because Merlot will give you a different texture from Cabernet Sauvignon. Merlot will give you always the roundness, the silkiness, and quite a lot of concentration of red fruit. And I think you can feel it in 13. This is a wine that is ready to drink. 13 you can enjoy from now already, or if you want to keep, you can also keep uh, all the wines that Chateau Pichon Baron are made for aging too. There's no problem. But I would say that 13 is in a very good moment. Uh, you can feel because I actually, I didn't open it very long before. Um, and it's already very, um, how do you say, expressive and talkative. You can feel a lot of the cherries, the little red berries on the nose. You can feel uh, also hints of raspberry. It's a fresh wine overall because this is a year, 13, which was a bit colder uh, with a bit more wet, more rainy in spring and in winter. So you have a wine that also reflects a fresher year. That is all, that's why it's already ready to drink in such um, a fresh, silky uh, type of style. Mm. 
That's really lovely right now. So you can tell that even if it's a Poyac, which is an appellation famous for very big, very masculine type of wines, you have here the charm of Turel. Turel comes from that specific plot, a bit more inland in Poyac, always from the same vineyards. It's a personality of that vineyard. It always expresses the personality of that vineyard. And it's a very seductive personality. Even when we taste Amprimar, when we taste barrel samples of Turel, it's already very charming and easy yeah. to test. We, we were talking about Primer before we started yeah. this. And it's very different tasting Turel and Primer and tasting, for example, Griffon, which is more Cabernet based uh, and much more structured and a bit a bit closed in the beginning and then beautiful when it ages, but you have to be patient. With Turel, you don't have to wait so much, so if you're impatient like me, <laughs> this is wine I drink at dinner at home uh, when I'm with my family uh, or on Sundays when we roast uh, some, uh, some meat. Uh, it can be also very nice, the 13, with um, creamy dishes like risotto, if you enjoy um, some risotto, or uh, that type of, um, can be with pasta that has um, mushrooms or truffles too. Uh, that type of uh, aromatics would go very well with the charm and the silkiness of Turel. We don't use a lot of new oak on purpose. We only use 30% new barrels um, and only for 12 months of aging. So it's quite a, a shorter time compared to the other wines. If you compare with the next wine, which is Griffon, actually taste them if you if you have two glasses at home side by side to see the difference. Griffon comes from vineyards that are closer to the chateau, a bit more stony soils. Turel was more small gravels and sand. Soils that are a bit colder and more adapted to Merlot. Griffon comes from plots that have already the famous gravels of Poyac, a bit bigger, uh, that will warm up with the sun and release the heat during the night. So you have bunches that are a bit more concentrated and that's why the wine is overall more about the dark fruit. You can feel on the nose immediately. It's much more on the blackberry, blueberry type of aromas. Whereas Turel was more the cherries, the raspberries and softer uh, in general. Griffon is closer to the style of uh, Pichon Marron because it has more Cabernet. It's 52% Cabernet Sauvignon, 48% uh, Merlot. We don't use Petit Verdot uh, in uh, Griffon and in Pichon Baron because of the vineyards. Uh, the vineyards of Turel, they have Petit Verdot. Uh, it's just related to location. For us, it's very important to express the site. So Anna, can you um, clarify that actually both of these wines are second wines, it's just a different style, different yes. blend? Exactly, so these two wines are second wines of Pichon Baron, um, but the style is very different and the blend is very different. So Turel is a wine that we've been making since the 80s. And as I said, it always comes from the same vineyards. Uh, it's always very charming, a Merlot dominant, and a wine that you can enjoy a bit earlier. And then Griffon is a wine that we started making in 2012 that always has a bit more Cabernet Sauvignon and it's always a bit more structured uh, and you usually have to wait a few more years in the bottle before you can uh, enjoy. Uh, I would not say one is better than the other, I cannot choose. They're just uh, very different styles because they don't come from the same uh, plots and they don't have the same blend. Uh, it's like two children and they have different personality. Different children, exactly. <laughs> I would say maybe this is a more well-behaved lady. <laughs> okay, and the other is a, a more uh, rebel girl, a more, a more rebel. Masculine boy <laughs> and a girl version. <laughs> yes, it's just a very different styles. With Griffon, we also do a bit more time in barrel. We do 18 months mm -hmm. and more new oak. We use 60% uh, new oak. So, whereas in the other wine, uh, it was more fruit forward and more red fruit forward. Um, with still a little bit of spice. Uh, in Griffon, you have that darker uh, black pepper on the nose that is very typical of Poyac uh, wines. Mm. Mm. 
We are tasting 2016 too, remember. 16, very big year in Bordeaux. It's a year of uh, very balanced weather. We had very high sunshine, but the weather was not too hot. So you have uh, a very good balance between tannin and acidity and alcohol. And that's why it feels um, so big and so structured, even for uh, a second wine like, uh, like Griffon. And now we'll taste our top wine, Pichon Baron Le Grand Vin, that comes from the vineyards that are right next um, to Chateau Latour, right next to the D3 road. And that's what we call our historical plot. It's 40 hectares of very deep gravels, quite big stones uh, that drain the rainwater very well. That's very important for Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, Cabernet is a grape that doesn't like when the soil is wet. And we have perfect soil for Cabernet Sauvignon because we have good drainage. Also, we are close to the river again, which gives us protection. And these stones, they are white, so they will reflect the sun and make sure that the Cabernet Sauvignon ripens perfectly and doesn't have the green flavors uh, that you can find in some regions uh, with Cabernet Sauvignon if it's underripe. Uh, at Pichon, uh, and specifically in this historical plot, we always have perfectly ripe thick skins in the Cabernet grapes uh, and no aromas of uh, bell pepper or, or green aromas. And in 11, you have a wine that's very classic and really a lovely expression of, uh, of Poyac. You can tell only by the first sniff, I'm sn even from far away, I, I can feel uh, the powerful uh, aromas of, uh, of Cabernet. You can feel also hints of dark chocolate, bitter chocolate uh, that are really lovely. Uh, and for me, it has a, a very pure fruit uh, character that comes from these stony soils. Uh, and we are in this triangle. It's really a, one of the best spots for Cabernet in the world, this triangle between Leo Velasquez, Chateau Latour and Pichon Baron, um, one of the top spots uh, for this variety. We do a bit longer time of aging because Cabernet needs time to integrate the fine grain tannins of, um, of French oak. So we do 10, 20 months in, uh, in barrel and we use 80% uh, new barrels for this one. But it's very well integrated, very refined, just a hint of toast uh, and vanilla on the nose. And what I'm really finding interesting when I'm tasting 11 this year is that oh, it was a year that started a bit austere. When the vintage came out, uh, people were saying, well, it's classic Poyac, it's, uh, it's, it's high quality tannin, but it's quite, um, how do you say, a tight wine. It was a bit shy. We didn't want to talk too much, uh, a bit austere. And now uh, 11 is proving that it just needed time in the bottle. Uh, it's almost 10 years of age, which is a great moment uh, to open uh, a bottle of, uh, of Chateau Pichon Baron after 10 years of age. Uh, you can start to feel uh, the mellow tannins uh, that are starting to soften and the aromas are much more expressive now and you can really get that very pure fruit uh, of, uh, of Pichon Baron. Very full body of course, this needs a, a nice red meat or duck or lamb to go with it uh, and very long finish. It's a wine that stays, stays, stays. I think you'll feel it uh, for a long time. Uh, we're gonna uh, later uh, move into into port and uh, and Quinta de Noval, but before you'll you'll see a video uh, of Quinta de Noval, and I'm sure. Oh, you'll... Anna, we have to take the mandatory photo of everybody. Ah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, it's the Yes. Yeah, so um, Cheryl, can we have the full screen for everybody? So um, okay. So we would like to, uh, everybody to on your video so that we can actually take a picture of all our yes. participants. Uh, we usually post this on the Facebook and Instagram, so if you follow us, Good you'll idea. be able to see this on our IG stories. Yeah. Oh, well. So, uh, yes, one video and on the count of three, please raise your glass if you have a sample, and then we will take the group photo together. Okay? One, Santé. two, three. All right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we can so be to do the Quinta de Nova um, video. We are traveling to Portugal now. 
<laughs> yes, we have moved to Portugal. Nice to see uh, to see images. They uh, they talk. Uh, they teach you quickly a lot about the region. Um, you could see again our general manager Christian Silly, uh, and also the, the the chief winemaker of Noval Antonio Grello's uh, for many many years. Antonio uh, has retired now, and his uh, his nephew is continuing the the wine making at uh, at Quinta do Noval. Uh, this is, of course, a very special place for me, being uh, Portuguese, even if uh, I studied and lived in France for, uh, for many, many years. Um, the Douro is, is very special because it is uh, the largest mountain viticulture area in the world. As you can see on the, on the picture, uh, we are working in, in the mountains with very steep uh, terraces uh, at altitudes between um, 50 and 500 meters. Uh, some people even have uh, vineyards up to 700 meters um, of height. So it's a, a very uh, difficult conditions for, uh, for working the vineyards. It's a very warm, hot area too. I think you can almost feel the, the heat uh, from the picture, but different from uh, Singapore hot <laughs> because it's, uh, it's very dry. So we can have many months, sometimes four or five months without uh, almost any rain and still we don't use irrigation um, because we are lucky to have uh, schist soils that keep the water uh, inside and uh, the, the vineyards um, on these schist soils can dig deep because the rock is easily broken. You can break schist quite easily, uh, this type of schist uh, that we have in the Douro. And the, the, the vineyards can go deep and, uh, and get the water they need even during the hot uh, summer months. So that's very important. The soil that we have in the Douro, the mother rock is schist. Um, the other important thing is of course that we have to work uh, the mountain. So we do terracing. You can see the terraces uh, in the image. Uh, the, the house that you see, it's Quinta do Noval's uh, historical house. It's also where we still make uh, our top ports 
in a very traditional way. We still do food stomping. You saw it on the video. It's not just uh, for tourists or for folklore. We do it every night, food stomping, for a month and a half uh, during harvest. So it's still a very uh, traditional way of winemaking that works very well for port. Compared to Bordeaux, I would say it's a region that is not as high tech. Um, it's more about uh, old school traditions um and uh, mixing uh, varieties too in portugal we never use only one or two varieties we always use five six seven uh, that's why when you look at a bottle of port you rarely see the variety and even when you look at the technical sheet you'll see maybe uh, five or six different portuguese names uh, so we only use portuguese varieties to make port and we always blend them that's how historically the wines were made um, if we move on on the slide, because I do want to have time for questions later, uh, you can see our location. So we are north of Portugal, uh, a bit central in terms of uh, a bit inland. And you can see Spain uh, on our side, it's the gray part. <laughs> and the Douro is a river that goes through a lot of great wine regions, actually. It goes through Ribera del Duero, that you probably have tasted many times. Uh, it goes through Toro, which also makes beautiful wines in Spain, and then it goes into the Portuguese side, uh, where we call it Douro instead of Duero, but it's the same river, of course. Um, and in Douro, a Portuguese side, we make both very good port wines and also some red wines uh, from the same uh, varieties and the same region. This river joins the Atlantic Ocean in Porto City and the city gave name to the wine. So the wine is called Port, but actually it is made a bit more inland, about one hour drive, one hour and a half from Porto, in the vineyards of the Douro Valley that you saw on the images that are very steep and in the mountains. This area is very special. It's UNESCO World Heritage. Uh, I think you can tell why. Uh, because to make our vineyards, it requires a lot of uh, work by hand. It requires a lot of effort and sometimes we even have to use uh, explosives to create soil in this area because it is so rocky um, everywhere. We use the, the stones to make the terraces. You can see the walls, the schist walls that are holding the terraces together. Um, and uh, we have uh, 145 hectares of vineyard at Quinta do Noval we work with our own fruit, which is not the most common in the port business. Um, if you think about big brands like Sandman, uh, Grahams, Taylors, uh, these are merchants, uh, merchants names. So they, they have vineyards, but they also buy a, a lot of grapes uh, from all over the, the Douro Valley. Noval is a bit of an exception because we work with basically one site, one hill. It's the concept that you have a bit in Burgundy, the Clos. We work with 145 hectares all together in one hill, and we have all the vineyards from the top at 500 meters to the bottom at 50. Um, we do everything by hand. Uh, as you can see, harvest, pruning, most of the soil work and spraying has to be done by hand. And we use the varieties uh, Toriga Nacional, that's the most famous one, and Toriga Franca, Tinta Roriz, which is Tempranillo, uh, probably you know this grape very well because of Rioja. Uh, we also have uh, Tempranillo in Portugal, uh, but we call it uh, Tinta Roriz in the Douro. Uh, we also use Tintocão and Sozão. These are all uh, very thick-skinned, um, dark color varieties. Usually for port, you use grapes that are rich in tannin, rich in color, basically. So, um, Today, uh, if we continue, you're going to taste a wine that was made in a very traditional way. All our vintage ports are vinified in lagar. What does that mean? A lagar is the open tank that you see on the picture with the people stomping. A lagar is an open vat. We don't use stainless steel tanks for our ports. We use open fermenters made of stone. The stone is granite, actually. Uh, for the lagars, and we use people to go from a whole bunch to juice. Instead of using a crusher, we do it with our feet. Uh, it's a process that we call corte uh, and, or pizza a pé, 
And that takes three hours to go from whole bunch to juice. And it's very important because it will extract color, aromas and tannins without breaking the seeds, without getting bitter oils. So it's actually a very high quality way of getting all that flavor. And it's not dangerous, don't worry. <laughs> Some people are uh, afraid that they're drinking wine where there was fit. <laughs> don't worry about it. Uh, it's the most ancient way of uh, wine making. We add brandy to port, remember, it's a fortified wine. So in the middle of fermentation, what will happen is that we will add very strong uh, spirit, grape spirit, which is 77% alcohol. So imagine it's very strong uh, into the grape must that is fermenting. So all the yeast, all the bacteria is killed. There is no danger <laughs> in port, it's very safe. Also, if you did chemistry at, um, at high school or university, you remember that fermentation will kill pretty much everything. So there's no risk of uh, using uh, human uh, feet to do the, the crushing. Mm -hmm. so, as I said, it's a fortified wine. It's a wine that has around 19.5% alcohol. You'll taste it uh, on your glass. So it's a wine that's always very intense, very powerful. And specifically, vintage port is very powerful because the result of only one harvest, from the very best plots, the very best grapes. A vintage port is always the top category of a port producer. It's a selection of the best grapes in a very good year. We have to make vintage port every year, only when the weather is really perfect and we have the right concentration in the fruit, we make vintage port. We only made around 1,600 um, cases. Some years we make a bit more. I think in 17 we made more because it's a very good year for port. It's a, a classic declaration of vintage, uh, but always a small amount uh, of, uh, of wine, uh, about seven to 10% of the production uh, of the estate. So it's the very best uh, plot. With the Portuguese varieties, um, Turiga Nacional, Turiga Franca or Francesa, Tinto mm -hmm. I don't ask you to memorize all of this. <laughs> I think the most important to know would be Toriga Nacional. That's the most planted at Quinta do Noval. And that's the variety that gives you a beautiful aroma that I'm feeling, which is violet. You get a lot of dark flower aromas in port. Also red plums, very typical of port too. You can feel it here. This is still a very young wine. Vintage port is made to age for a hundred years. So, of course, we won't wait that long, <laughs> especially because it's so delicious young, but it's a great uh, wine if you want to keep it for children or grandchildren. Um, or if you like them young, open them about two hours before the tasting and try serving it slightly chilled, like at, I would say, 14, 15 Celsius is a nice, uh, temperature. You can go even lower if it's a warm day in Singapore. Uh, it can be very lovely with uh, cheese, with blue cheese, or with chocolate desserts, uh, brownie uh, or strawberry cheesecake. It can really be a beautiful match. Or in the case of Vintage 17 Quinta de Noval, on its own, after a, a long day uh, at work, it can really uh, do wonderful things <laughs> to relax you. It's a very powerful wine and very special. As you can tell, a bit higher in alcohol. It is a fortified wine. It's a wine that has a lot of tannins, very deep color. You cannot see through. If you use a white paper, you cannot see your fingers. That's the color of the Portuguese varieties and also the result of extraction by fit. I think if you have questions, it's a good time to, uh, uh, to answer them. I know I talked about very different regions. It's a lot of information, but hopefully you enjoy the, the wines and the presentation. We do have some questions. I think people are still digesting all the information because we are we, we 
mentioned uh, the different lines. So let them digest a little bit. But I'll start with the first question. Uh, someone is asking about more about EXA. Uh, Sean Yang was asking, why has EXA ministry diversified into wine? As there doesn't seem there don't seem to be much commonity between wine and insurance. It's asking if it's more yes. about prestige, financial investment, or both. So. Um, AXA Millennium started like this. As you know, AXA is a an insurance company and uh, in the 80s, uh, the president of AXA Insurance, Claude Bebeard, he's one of the greatest uh, French wine collectors actually. Um, he is very passionate about wine, um, still today, even if he's not the, the president of, uh, of AXA anymore. Um, and so it came from him, it came from uh, the passion of one person uh, who happened to be the president of, uh, of Axe Insurance. Uh, so he wanted to invest in wineries. And originally he wanted to invest in French patrimony, in French heritage. Uh, and so that's why they started with Bordeaux. They started with uh, Pichon Baron and they also started in uh, Domaine de l'Arlo in, uh, in Burgundy. Those were the, uh, those are the oldest ones. Uh, later, uh, they decided to diversify and to invest also in, in Portugal and in Hungary in the 90s. What all these wineries have in common, the Aximilesim wineries, is that they are wineries with long history and very high reputation, but they were going through a more difficult phase when they were acquired. Uh, that's the case for Quinta do Noval in the early 90s. That's the case for Pichon Baron in the late 80s, because the owners uh, at the time could not continue to invest uh, in the land. So that's what they have uh, in common. Very long history, prestige, and uh, high a reputation in the past, but they were all going through a moment where they needed some love. Uh, and it came from the passion of, uh, of Mr. Claude Bebea, yes. Mm. For image, of course, it helps to be very honest. Uh, all the workers at Axe Insurance, they love having uh, the special offers at Christmas that they get. Uh, they love knowing that they have wineries that they can visit uh, in France. They can use our properties, of course, for events too, uh, for clients. It's always a, a very exclusive um, a place to do uh, business events and that also uh, is a positive point, uh, of course. You can see that they are buying more wineries because you have the new wineries like um, another, you have, there's a few wineries that were recently bought. Recently acquired, yes. Yeah. So uh, the, the most recent one was Passadoro, which is in Portugal too, in the Douro. Oh, okay. Quinta do Noval. Uh, because Noval is growing actually, uh, both in, in terms of premium ports as in red wines. And so we, we were really happy uh, to, to acquire our neighbor actually, Quinta do Passadoro, which is right next, the plots are next to each other, similar soil, uh, easy to, to adapt. Uh, and now we can make uh, a bit more red wine that we want to develop too, a dry red wine from the Douro. Okay, we have a next question. So Matthias asked, I think that we answered, uh, which is considered as the second label of Pichon Baron between Tura and <laughs> Again, it's always the... I know, I know uh, because these are our babies. Tone uh, <laughs> doesn't like to call one of them a third wine. So we say both are second wines. I know it's confusing, but... <laughs> yeah, but, but both are second wines. But to be honest, uh, that is the right way of presenting them. Both are second wines because they don't come from the same vineyard. One comes from St. Anne plot, which is more inland Merlot, and one comes from the plots around the chateau, which is closer to the Gironde and more Cabernet Sauvignon. So we consider they are equal <laughs> second wines, yes, with very okay. different style. So we'll put that to dust now. Everybody understand that these two are same but different. Both. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, the other question is, okay, once open, I think uh, pot, okay, how many days can a bottle of pot last in the fridge, wine fridge? Yes. So, depending on the style of port. This was a very short presentation of port. You can do two hours, three hours on port. It's a very complex region. So, for this one, it's a bit sensitive. I would say you have to finish the bottle in two or three days. Vintage port, you have to treat it like a red wine. So when you open it, open it with friends and finish the bottle. And why is that? Because as you can tell, this is a wine that is not uh, oxidative. It's a, a wine that was bottled young 
and is meant to be aged in the bottle. So when you take the cork, it starts to ev evolve. The evolution starts. So I would say finish it in three days. But as you know, there are ports that you can keep for six months, no problem. Those are the Tony ports. Uh, so buy a 10 year old Tony, a 20 year old or a 40 year old Tony, no problem. Because Tony is a style of port that is aged in small barrels um, called ca uh, casks, port casks, uh, and they are in contact with air. We don't top up the barrels, there's some space, and the oxygen will go in and oxidate the wine slowly. That's on purpose. We do that for tonics to achieve aromas of walnuts, toffee, caramel, and a very light brown color. So if you buy a vintage port, you'll always have this dark, uh, concentrated, beautiful uh, chocolate feel. And if you buy a Tony port, you'll have a wine that is orange brown in color and that smells like dry fruit uh, and toffee. And those wines are very resistant after opening. Uh, we sell them a lot in restaurants, for example, because they can do by the glass, they can sell them by the glass and not worry about what will happen to the rest of the bottle. So yeah. Tony's are nice if you're just drinking one glass uh, and you should serve them chilled. And Port is great when you have a group of five, six friends and you want to have a, a good time and no, uh, not in a hurry. <laughs> yes. Okay, so um, okay, next question. Um, Amy is asking, what is the difference between using food treading versus state-of-the-art machine for fruit extraction? Is one super, uh, super, superior to the other? Well, nowadays, uh, most wineries in the Doro use both. Um, we do uh, ports in tank, so in modern winemaking, for our simple ruby and our simple tawny. So more uh, simple ports, we make them modernly because it is too expensive uh, to use people. But we still believe at Quinta do Noval that the best results uh, come from uh, extraction uh, that is traditional and with people. And that's as I explained, because it is a very soft way of getting the tannin out of the skins. Even, um, even a big guy, when he's stomping, he cannot break the seeds. Whereas when you're using stainless steel equipment, you will always get a little bit more harshness. So for us, um, we like to use um, people and do it traditional for all the styles from LBV up. So late bottle vintage, vintage, uh, in colheita, so top ports we do traditionally, and more simple ports that are more fruity, more easy drinking, we make them in a modern way. Yes. Um, I know some quintas do everything with robots. I, I think probably you can get very, very, I'm sure you can get very nice results. But imagine, it's also a, a very important tradition for us. Quinta do Noval has had people stomping at harvest since 1715 every September. So it would be very sad uh, to say that in 2000 and imagine 21, we stop. It would be very sad. So for us, it's also because of uh, sociology. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's very important to keep that alive. It's a moment of uh, togetherness uh, and it's a moment of sharing. We are not sure how we'll do it this year though. That's uh, a oh, yeah, that's true. With the, with the mask. <laughs> Yes. Some yes. social distancing. Also, yeah, we bought a special suit so they can uh, wear and take off uh, uh, yeah. disposable. It's it's not the same. Uh, yeah, that's true. Okay. Um, okay, Luca was asking, how much is the proportion of agua diante that you add yes. into the 40 to 45 for the pot? Yes. So agua diante is the grape spirit that we add to port. Uh, we It's about 20% of your bottle. Uh, most of the time for a vintage, it's 17, 18% of your bottle. So what I mean by this is that uh, a port bottle is about 80% grape juice, fermented, partially fermented grape juice to 20% aguardente. Um, we add the spirit when the fermenting wine is at 6, 7% alcohol. Okay, to give you an idea. 
Mm, and then again, it depends on how, how much sugar you want to leave on your final port. At Quinta do Noval, we usually have uh, 98 to 100 grams per liter of sugar in our vintage port. So it's less than Sautern, less than Tukai, just to give you a, an idea. Uh, but some houses like Grams, they are famous for doing sweeter styles. Mm. They will add the aguardente a bit earlier. Um, it depends. I see. Okay. Um, okay. Willie has a question. He said that uh, because we carry the uh, white pot as well. So oh, right, um, right. can you explain how do you make a white pot and if you have a pink pot? Okay. So we don't make pink. Uh, I would consider, I would describe Quinta de Noval as a very traditional producer. Uh, and Pink Port was introduced in 2009 uh, by Croft, by the brand Croft. And it's a fun style, but it's not something uh, we are doing. Uh, not, not yet, and I'm not sure if we will do. It's mostly used in cocktails uh, and served on ice. Uh, it's, it's a fun thing, but it's, it, we have, uh, all our vineyards are classified with the A letter which is the top quality for port. That means we can basically make vintage almost every year. And it means we are very well located. And for Antonio, who is a traditional man, um, it just doesn't feel right to use those grapes for, for rosé. But I'm, I don't know, maybe in the future. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, white. Uh, white port is a very small part of what we do. We don't have a lot of white grapes planted uh, at Quinta do Noval, only at the top of the hill. Uh, and we make it in a modern way. It's not uh, with the people foot stomping. We make it in stainless steel. Because if you tasted our fine white and our extra dry, I'm sure you have, Diana, uh, it's a very light in color. So it's not oxidized uh, and very lemon, uh, lemon white flowers, grapefruit type of flavors. So we try to do a very crisp, a uh, modern white port, yes. Okay, uh, we have a last question. Um, it's from Stephanie <laughs> Lin. Uh, Hi Anna, any insights on the trend in Duro? Uh, dry steel wines getting more popular and why? Yes, they are, they are. <laughs> it's actually a very uh, exciting moment for dry reds. Um, even if Quinted Noval is still nowadays almost 80% port, the production and 20% red wine, a little bit of wine. Um, it is growing and in Portugal, in the local market, the Douro is considered as the best region for red wine. Uh, we also have red wines in Alentejo, in Bairrada, in Dão, in other regions of Portugal, but the Douro is seen as the most prestigious uh, and this is where you have wines reaching prices very close to those of Bordeaux. Um, you can find Douro red wines at 100, 200 euros, whereas only 20 years ago, you didn't have anything of that type. So it's really a, a very exciting moment. I think why, uh, well, of course, sugar is not as trendy as it was. So it's a good way of diversifying. But we don't want to stop making port, especially because premium port is still... Uh, selling very well and growing in the UK and USA, for example. Um, what we want to do is both. We want to have vineyards like we always did for Port, our historical hill at Quinta do Noval. And we need vineyards now for red wine making too, because there's a lot of potential with Toriga Nacional getting famous. Um, you see Toriga Nacional in South Africa, in Napa, you see it in Australia. It's becoming a very interesting variety uh, mm -hmm. with warming too because it's very resistant. Toriga Nacional even when it's 35 Celsius it can still do photosynthesis it can still accumulate sugar and be um, how do you say be ripe without being shriveled. So very interesting variety for the future I think. Okay, uh, wait, just before, uh, just one more question is about Pichon Baron. Uh, Mark is asking for the Pichon Baron, you mentioned that it is almost 10 years and we can start to drink. What about the 2010 vintage? Is it, is it a good time to yes. drink now? So, of course, uh, Great Bordeaux, people usually waited 20 years. But we are aware that most of our customers don't wait. <laughs> so, uh, I would say 10 years is already a good moment, you can tell even by 11. Uh, but you have some exceptions, which are 
very big years in Bordeaux. 2010 is one of those years, 16 is another of those years, and probably 19 will be a bit like that. These are wines where you have record high polyphenols. Uh, what I mean is record high concentration of color, of tannin, um, very nice acidity too, to balance. So those, I would say, wait a bit. Uh, we served 2010 at dinner at Pichon Baron uh, right now, so uh, this year already. Yeah. Um, if we are doing duck or lamb, uh, it works very well and of course people are, are very pleased to drink such a perfect uh, vintage from Bordeaux, but I'm sure it can still get better. Um, 2010 will develop those beautiful tobacco and you know truffle aromas that come with age. So if you can wait maybe at least four years more, uh, it will pay off. It's such a perfect vintage in Bordeaux. Yeah, wait a little bit more. <laughs> okay. All right, it's very good. Thank you very much. It's very educational. I think a lot of the participants, uh, I'm, I'm sure they, they really learn a lot from you. It's very nice uh, to meet you for the first time as well. So um, we're just going to move to our last uh, slide, uh, Sharon. Yeah. So basically, the wines are on offer now on our Crystal Wines website. And um, we are on Instagram and also on Facebook. So if you're on this session, you might want to tag us in the IG Live or Facebook Live and share your photos with us. Um, so please visit crystalwines.com if you want to know more about our upcoming virtual class and also the current wine offers. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, uh, please uh, feedback to us at marketing at crystalwines.com. Uh,